the sidebar, a book club for sensitive young men. I'm David. I'm Gabe. And I'm Capitalism. You can call me Cap. And we're here, gathered again tonight, to discuss the first half of Millennium by Marty Phillips. Published by Jackalope Hill, an imprint of Antelope Hill in 2023. As is tradition, I'd like to ask you two gentlemen, what do we know about this Marty Phillips guy? Well, he's most well known for his first novel, Let Them Look West. I believe it was the first fiction imprint of Angelo Pill, if I recall correctly. Um, set in Montana, it is Christian fiction that isn't cringe. And that was actually about it. I only know him from word of mouth. I know he has a WordPress and a blog. But other than that, he was mostly a mystery. I, I, didn't, I didn't even know that. <laughs> And I only knew him as, I know he's affiliated generally with the right-wing scene on Twitter. I think he has some affiliation with something called the NJP, the National Juanita Association, which has sort of a Latina, white male uh, coupling uh, political alignment. Many but, such cases. Yeah, many such <laughs> cases. And I guess you can really see it come through in his literature. But I came in pretty blind in terms of his writing. I simply... I read some of his WordPress. I had actually seen his, uh, he has a YouTube series of uh, a Let's Play of The Sims. I had watched a few episodes of way, way back and had a good chuckle at. You know him mostly for his work, deleting the ladder out of a pool and watching a cartoon person. <laughs> he did. I think he had a whole segment of that series where he gang stalked the, uh, the wife, who was the hot, the hot lady, uh, Mrs., uh, Mrs. Gothic. And kind of cuckold the the husband, so did it work? It did, yeah, it worked. And he, he, it was kind of a monkey paw wish, and then it, I I never saw how the series ended. I just kind of lost track of it because because it, it ran on a long time. Couldn't possibly have ended any way other than tragedy, <laughs> as often infidelity does. Yeah, the classic Sims uh, conclusion. Much like The Sims, uh, we're, today we're discussing Millennium, the story of 21st century tragedy. It's a series of, I believe, two short stories and two novellas. That we've only read the first half up until this point. A short story by the name of Falwell and a second story by the name of The Holy Hunt. And there's a short introduction at the beginning. And so... As we try to do here, let's start with a spoiler-free initial impression for anyone that just Googled, you know, the, the book title and came across this. Initial impressions, and then we'll dive into a blow-by-blow. Blow. So the project here of Millennium is to, um, according to the introduction, give a perspective on sort of the the timeline of being a millennial. So fittingly, the first story, Fallwell, is about 9-11, the actual 9-11 attacks. And the, the gimmick is that the falling man famously pictured, uh, so, well, I, there are several jumpers, but pictured in the 9-11 photos is experiencing a Groundhog Day scenario. So... This this guy jumps, meets an angel halfway down. Angel resets time uh, several times for him uh, before, and every time he he falls a little further until he he eventually uh, uh, strikes down. My impression of it is that I feel like thematically, what Phillips was trying to get at was how everyone has watched that have, everyone has watched those attacks happen a uh, hundred times. It's, it's a, a single, very, a couple very catastrophic events, but we've watched them replay so often that now, you know, they're sort of memes to us. But the catastrophe of the events uh, is something that has sort of been re-experienced continuously since. Um, well, my take on it was, well... The, the whole mission statement of Millennium is about the millennial generation. You know, Marty Phillips, he talks about introduction and in interviews I've seen. He discusses that the millennial generation is a hostage. Millennial as hostage. Right? We were promised a certain future. We were told every... Well, not we. Y'all. Sorry, I'm a Zoomer. Get out. <laughs> he very much feels... 
<laughs> Listen, I, I will tell his ass to get himself by the bootstraps, right? Because if you notice, the entire thing is about the perception of 9-11. The 9-11 is like the hinge point of his cosmology. Right. And, and I'll, I'll delve more further when we discuss the plot of it. But it's very, very fitting that this is his start point. If you were to give him a, a calendar, you know, instead of AD or BC, it would be like B911 and A911. Like, it, it, this is so much cosmologically significant for him, right? And the overall tone of it, it reminds me of the film um, Conspiracy Theory by Mel Gibson. Um, great film. It's very fast paced. Um, overall, it's very a very breezy read. It has a lot of quality, and um, it packs a lot of punch. It packs a lot of punch, I'd say. So, if you want a nice fast paced read, you know, and spoiler free wise, I do think the first story, if you will get a nice tone and overall thematic theming of the entire piece of being a millennial, if you relate to that, you know, if you're like have a hauntology of nine eleven, I do think. Looking through his lens, the first story will get you through. And I would say to someone that is considering picking up that it is very intentfully written. And I think there is a lot of quality there. Um, stylistically, I'd say it's very similar to sort of a Joseph Conrad novella. So if you like that writing style, I think it would go pretty far for you. If you don't like that writing style, it probably would not be a great fit. You think that Falwell is reminiscent of Joseph Conrad. His overall writing style, I would not say Falwell is okay, particularly... Okay, okay. No, no. And stylistically, um, the second story, The the Holy Hunt is... Yeah, Holy, Holy Hunt is a uh, heavy, heavy riff on Heart of Darkness. But I would say his overall, even even his writing style, I would say is, is pretty Joseph Conrad in terms of... I'll get into to it when we go into specific chapters, but it, it's, it's most explicit. Yeah, definitely in The, the Holy Hunt. If that, if that ring style appeals to you, conceptually, if you're interested in the premise of a millennial, a sort of ode to the millennial, I think it labors under that premise a little bit. We'll get into that. And I have, um, hopefully I don't come across as overly negative because I, I enjoyed it and I thought the quality was, was, was quite high overall. But yeah, so, so overall, worth checking out uh, if those... Mean- Allegorical history of the last 20 years. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's, uh, we, we've all been there if you're listening to this. Except for Gabe, who wasn't there because he's a toddler. He, he's, <laughs> he's eighteen. Yeah, exactly eighteen. Listen, I, I was hey, twenty-two. I was second in a ballot yeah. in my dad's ball sack. All right, a resident Athenian. You were born on nine eleven. <laughs> I wish. All right, so bow out now. Obviously, if you're if you haven't read it yet, and then we can dive into the spoilers. And first off, there's the the intro, and I think Cap, you had mentioned before we started recording that you had some thoughts on the introduction. Yeah, so Antelope Hill is an ostensibly white identitarian publishing house. Um, And this book talks about how he's specifically trying to highlight uh, the the white male perspective. But, I mean, there's nothing particularly, you know, and maybe the second half of the book is different, but there's nothing particularly, like, white identitarian about the first two stories. I mean, not. I wouldn't. I wouldn't even say like not particularly. There's nothing that's that's white identitarian about the first two books. Mm-hmm. So it's. I don't know. The complete reprinting of Mein Kampf in the back was a little bit suspect. Yeah, it's kind of strange to do that as a footnote. It's really not very readable. <laughs> it's very meta. It's very meta. Yeah, you just you just st- you just start one ellipse uh, halfway th- down a page, and then you know you gotta <laughs> you gotta read the whole thing. So, but yeah, there, there's nothing particularly about it. And I mean, in terms of the s- securing a future, et cetera, et cetera, all, all those, I, I believe there's a specific number of words about it. The only female uh, who love interest who showed themselves in, in the first half of this book is a smoking hot Latina, which is uh, on brand, I guess. Uh, I, I, well, and don't I, forget the I blonde certainly wife. don't have any objections. Well, yeah, but the blonde wife was a non-entity. The n- blonde wife and was, was furniture. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and childless. Yeah. Oh, he had more. He had more chemistry with a fucking angel, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not overtly political and trying to shove it in your face. So you know, it, 
Well, mm. there's there's a political viewpoint for sure, but it's not overtly yeah, identita- a- white identitarian in terms of the yeah, the structure. After it's mentioned in the intro, yeah, but yeah, what is it? It's a th- two pager, so it's a pretty quick intro. Um, here I'll start off. So the first story is well, it's called Fallwell, and our protagonist is a stockbroker. I forgot what the 9/11 thing was even for. It's just an office um, worker. The buildings for, but um. It's just office work, general, office work. you know, paper pusher. Yeah, paper pusher. So he's pushing papers, and um, the planes are pushing buildings. Nice. And so we start off with him, you know, his boss, Chuck, you know, he commits suicide. It starts off, he hits the ground running, right? He grabs your attention immediately with the first sentence. Nice pun. Right, you know, he talks about, you know, I'm not the type to do suicide, that kind of thing. Chuck, uh, his poor Chuck, he... He sure is the type. Then he jumps. <laughs> yeah. Chucked himself right <laughs> exactly. off, off that building. Yeah, chucked and fucked, right? Um, but so he jumped off, and then of course he meets the angel named Glory. Now Glory is there for a reconnaissance, right? The G Man himself has sent Glory to figure out what the hell is going on, and he accidentally bumps into our friend uh, Falwell. He, uh, due to the fact of being in the angel's presence, has slowed down time. So. In order to make him feel better, he says to go, you know, I can make you travel back in time to spend time with family, but I also need you to retrace your steps. So when I say it was kind of a conspiracy theory, the film from Mel Gibson, it very much reads like a film script, a very fast pace, right? It, it, it very much is, it, it works like a thriller, actually, right? So he's he's sent through about four or five loops. Oh, you, 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 missed, this, you missed the step where he has to jump out of the window at the exact same time. Mm. Yes, that's that's the hook. He has to be at the exact same at the end of every loop. He has to go through the same window. Yep. Right? <laughs> Which is a, a lot of potential for comedy, right? But um, and this has comedy. But if you notice, all the comedy happens outside the twin tower. So twin towers. He even says, "quote like uh, you know they moan like old gods." Like he said, like the twin towers in his consciousness, it, like it's a hauntology. It, it is like it's a holy ground for him. So at the, at the first two loops. He starts retracing his steps. He's listening to the radio. He's trying to. He's making calls, and he realizes that the twin towers was a was an inside job, not by Bush, but a very Bush-like figure, Satan, right? Demons, right? So he realizes this is a just a like a strike uh, a strike across the bow in like a genuine holy war, and um, and he he looks further and further, and it's revealed that it's part of a holy war. Between, of course, God and, and the S Man. So, and throughout the story, you get the sense that the dialogue's very well. The angel named Glory is a fantastic character. Uh, his dialogue is perfect. He comes off very calm and collected. You know, he treats the protagonist like a puppy, like a slightly retarded puppy. He's 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 very much a Dan Aykroyd. He even drugs the protagonist with angel dust or whatever he calls it to uh, be calm. <laughs> no, it's 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 like mm-hmm. it's the do not be afraid thing from the Bible where he makes be you not afraid, calm. sir. Be not afraid. Absolutely. So the angel, the dialogue, everything is perfect. It, what Marty's really good because you you have three layers, right? The angel who is in the know. Uh, Falwell, who's semi in the know, and you got the general populace who have who have a clue, right, about the whole afterlife thing and everything else. So, we, he doesn't. It's very fast paced. It's revealed that you know there's men in black and they're summoning a Cthulhu, like almost like a Lovecraftian thing. It's nine eleven is part of his their plan for heaven. For well, there's a ritual in the building and, going on. Yeah. Mm-hmm, yes. The, yes. Uh, and. You don't get me started on that. So the first, like, it's the pace is very fast pace. The first seventy percent is great. It's only until it's really only until when he comes back in the building and he starts printing papers, and then he finds the Men in Black and he finds the little labyrinth that really lost me. Because when I read it the first time around, I really liked it. I'm like, okay, this is like a solid seven point five. I really liked it. But then, like. I have like three points. One, very good, fast paced. Two, dialogue's very good. Um, there's a lot of banter, there's a lot of humor. Um, it's, the, it's basically a thriller. However, my nitpicks are you know, there's just two quotes I thought of when I was reading this for the second time. Um, one is from Stanley Kubrick. He says, fundamentally, um, maybe he's making The Shining. He says, fundamentally, it's not a horror film. 
because it's about ghosts. And the thing with ghosts, it means afterlife. And fundamentally, you can't have an... You know, it's not horrifying. It's fundamentally a hopeful story. Anything involved in afterlife is fundamentally hopeful. It's fundamentally a comedy in the Latin sense, meaning like um, mean a happy ending. Well, except it's made very explicit that having jumped willingly, he is not going to the good place. Well, Glory tells it's, him it's directly. It's ambiguous. Well, no, he's, he says, I can't tell the future. I don't Fair know. Enough. And he says, I That's hope true. to see you again. That's true. The and of course, of course, the title, you know, he was trying to do good things with the time that was allotted to him. So perhaps there was some sort of redemption arc for him. Yeah, that the ending, <laughs> I want to comment with the angel even says like, oh, you know, maybe you're one of the lucky ones, which is kind of a dick move before you experience <laughs> a slow motion crushing death. I actually, th- I, I thought the ending was uh, really well chosen. I thought the ending to um, to Agreed. fall well was mu- uh, way stronger than uh, than Holy Hunt. Even though I realized the thematic oh. reasons for Holy Hunt, and we'll get into that. It later. was better, but I still but, had issues with it in oh. terms of it was similarly. It felt rushed to me in terms of the when the when the Goliath Titan of the devil rose up. It became so, it, for such a out of human experience thing to observe, it was described so briefly. It, to me, it was all front of the brain. Like, I can't picture this Super Saiyan battle going on where he's zipping around and there's this, you know, giant titan. So for me, that part of the, the end fell flat, but it was the rest right. of it went pretty well. Well, the thing is, it's a little bit At too end, breezy. Yeah. It's a little too fast paced because if you notice. It, the plot is very well done, and I'll, I'll, I'll quote my favorite line here. When you talked about the angel, he says, um, "He says, uh, I know death is a big deal for humans, but the new millennium holds many ill tidings, especially in light of what you discovered. You haven't considered that maybe this is for the best. You may be one of the fortunate ones. With the one last look of inner sympathy and a flash of light, the angel is gone. You know, that was a, mm-hmm. a kind of a good ending line. Like I said, he treats him very much like a puppy, which an angel should. But humans are retarded, right? So the angel, throughout the entire thing, kind of wants him just to kind of spend time with his family. He's kind of confused why he's doing what he's trying to do. Because plot-wise, very fast-paced. I liked it. The second time, I was looking for character. And this is a flaw that's kind of consistent throughout the two stories, is that Tom is an action figure. We don't know fuck all about Tom. (laughs) About, you know, he barely gets the time to breathe and reflect. Yeah, the, the scene with the wife was probably my favorite one. And it, she was not super fleshed out, but I actually still right. found it affecting because it was it gave that character depth and you got to see him be a human out of the plot. Yeah, it was so thin, though. It really was. Like, he says, the big line is, I, may, I think I believe in God or something like that. I'm like, that's nothing new. No shit. <laughs> the first half of the story, you acted as you yeah. did believe in God. Right? That's the thing. Like, we, when, he, when he was starting to walk his last day, you know, he was doing the flyers. And he says he wants to scout out. You know, he spends the whole night in the city. He goes to his favorite restaurant. I'm like, okay, we're going to get some fleshing out. You know, he's thinking about death. He's going to have a, some time of reflection. Out of all this, his job is done, right? Now he's just waiting for death. But then, no, the fucking Men in Black sh- bullshit came in. And the thing is, the Men in Black stuff was good on the phone. When he describes, mm-hmm. how, like, the demonic voice on the phone, and he feels the tendrils through the line, like, through the little pores of whatever old phones had. Like, there was actually some good tension. It, but when you actually see the Men so in Black... It's so fast. That's my problem. And that happens at the second story as well. I, I kind of feel like the Men in Black, I mean, I, to, to charitably try to read into this, because, I mean... In general, trying to tell something through allegory, which this is the entire project of this book, mm-hmm. all four stories, trying to tell something through allegory always ends up being either completely, uh, completely impenetrable, or a little on the nose. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure where the. I'm not sure where the 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 good balance is there. But you know, the Men in Black. It's you have this big event. And there's a conspiracy, but the exact moving parts of the conspiracy are... It's it's clear from this reading that you believe that there's a conspiracy, but you are... It's never explained what exactly it is or who exactly is doing it, right? So... Mm-hmm. All we know is it's part of a grander, like, literally, heaven yeah. award yes. from what Glory says. 
which I think is actually to its benefit. I, I like the fact that we are left. This is this little one little side quest Glory has, and Tom for Tom it's everything, right? But it's I like the fact there's so much that's unknown. It's left open. I, I thought that was actually kind of a good thing. I was a little disappointed he uh, cucked out with the actual planes hitting the towers. I was like, I really. <laughs> See, but no, that's the that's the thing. That's what I was talking about earlier. The twin towers are I'm sacred. Just, I'm joking for There's the record. Of, I do the, believe the, the dialogue, planes hit the, the towers. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I I thought because he, like he didn't really harp on it or go. They were obviously detail. cruise like, missiles. He describes. <laughs> You could you can tell from the frames you can tell from the frames in the second video the one shot from across the Hudson that what it actually was was Vegeta in Super Saiyan level two going on a full comet Amen Ha uh, and just shooting himself straight through spirit the building. bomb you can, straight spirit through bomb ladies and gentlemen spirit spirit <laughs> spirit bomb straight through it's spirit bomb and I'm sick of it that's where they kept the I'm dragon sick of balls it. they kept the dragon balls in Tower Seven. The first two, those were completely a distraction so that they could steal the Dragon Balls and resurrect Krillin for the fifth time. Was he worth it? Was he worth it? <laughs> Was Krillin the yes. bald midget? He's the strongest. The useless ah. guy. Yeah. Yeah. Really? I remember. Except, he, except hey, you know what? Maybe there is. Maybe there is a Dragon Ball subtext to this story. Because Krillin's wife is blonde and blue-eyed. Mm. There's a lot of blonde characters in this, actually. But when you realize that... So he, he, what Marty Phillips is really good at is setting. Right? It, it was very... You could see everything perfectly. It's very action-oriented. It's very well done. He knows how to set the stage. But his protagonists tend to be action figures. What I mean by that is he needs to advance the plot. He needs certain actions to be done. And so he gets protagonists like uh, Falwell, and he just does things. And when you read it a second time, you you kind of are more from the POV of Glory, the angel, where he's just kind of confused, like, why are you doing this? You know, he tries to, because he wastes his time trying to save these people, right? When he literally says, Limbo was frightening, of course, but Thomas figured that if his life was doomed anyway, then how much worse could it really be, Right. Notice this. He was not a religious man, and surely hell was worse than limbo. But saving all these lives for him was his own noble pursuit. Now, when you look back into it, you realize that he kind of wasted the fucking loop. Because the whole point, like the reason why I said um, the Stanley Cooper quote about anything involving an afterlife is from a comedy. So, imagine these planes crash, right? You know, like, you know, the gifts on pole, like, you see the burning, and oh, my hecking people, Reno, burning to death and falling, or whatever, right? You do realize, they're all, with the confirmation, if he is acting as a confirmation of the biblical heaven and hell exist, there is a confirmation of an afterlife, of the divine, right? You do realize that the, most of the people, like Lauren, the, the female character, the that, office that, lady. that grabs his yeah. arm, yeah, she'll go to heaven. Well, maybe. Like you're just maybe kinda... Lauren's in a state yes, of mortal well... sin, and what what the protagonist really ought to have done was to get a whole gang full of priests in there to do last rites for everyone. Hmm. hmm? Uh huh. Just exactly. No. That's... Set up set up a it, confession the... booth on the doors on the way in. Yeah, I I think maybe Catholicism is canon, but they do reference Enoch. So maybe some of the little Eastern Orthodox or Ethiopian Orthodox. Cop Coptic, yeah, Coptic so you... Christianity is the right one, according yep. to this story. <laughs> Cop yes. The Coptic Church. Listen. Yeah, that was the right one. We were close. We didn't get Listen. it, but we were close. See, exactly. See, he's not racist. He chooses to POC Christianity to be correct. Perfect. Right? <laughs> but, uh... When you have this blank slate, because he's not even every man, he's blank slate. Like, the wife thing, he just says, I believe in God, looks at her, oh my god, you're so pretty, I love you, and falls asleep. <laughs> you know what I mean? We don't even get any chance to reveal any of his character. He has more more emotions and more development with, with him with the angel. The angel, the wife was completely, completely forgettable. It was a short story, though. So there was, there was limited capacity to fit that in. But I... I I do agree. Him as the main protagonist, they could have he could have squeezed in more. I do also want to do shout out to the humor. Just it's a that's a tall it's a tall order to fit humor into a nine eleven story, <laughs> but but he actually does it pretty pretty effectively overall. 
No, I agree. Don't, the dialogue is perfect. Well, Gabe, you know, you did mention that no comedy happens in the towers, but at one point he he sort of lets it slip that he knows what's going on, and the office lady is holding his arms, and he's like. And she's like, you know something. Tell us. Why didn't you do anything? Why didn't you do anything? We have families. Something to that effect. And he's and mm-hmm. he's like, I'm trying. And then he dives out the window. <laughs> Baller. <laughs> but that, that wasn't an intentional comedy because he's, like, he's yeah, emotional. Well, not, he's, well, he, he's crying he, he like a bitch. He wasn't telling a joke there. But you read it and like, I, I definitely laughed aloud. When, <laughs> no, I agree with you, but that's not an intentional laugh. I thought it was funny, too. <laughs> right, because I vision the visual comedy when you visualize in your yeah. head, it's funny. Well, and and the the first the first paragraph of the story, he mentions the secret life of Walter Mitty and how he always kind of thought that suicide was a it wasn't a serious consideration and was um, was more of a slapstick routine, and that was absolutely slapstick. You know, saying I'm trying and then diving out the window is is yeah. is slapstick. Yeah, but yeah. like, the, but the way he describes the fire as like the sh- the the smoke, the tendrils trying to grab him, yep. like from the, his POV, I guess even when he meets the Colossus, like the um kind of uh, the giant um, uh, I think it was almost like Atlas holding up the two columns. I thought that was kind of clever, but you know when the demons almost got him, like he was going to go into limbo and he had to replace the guy holding up the twin columns. Right. Instead of an Earth, it was columns. I thought that was a nice little visual metaphor, like the Twin Towers. Yet again, right? Notice this. The end of Thomas's life, when he almost died, was the end of the Millennial's age. Right? The symbolism of the Twin Towers falling, the Twin Columns breaking down. Like, the, the, the Twin Towers is a severe cosmological event for him. This is a deeply, deeply, this is an epoch. Sure. On the, some certain sense, this is a work of copium. This is Millennial copium. It is the Twin Towers, 9-11 has to mean something. It is so it's biblically, it's eschatologically significant that it's almost a pseudo-wish fulfillment for him. That it can't be just politics, it can't be just a random terrorist attack. It's not even a, like a government psyop. It is a cosmological heaven or hell event. Right? Yep. So there's a, that's why I've... Because it's like, for me, I, I thought like black comedy. Like for him, just smoking a cigarette and saying, bitch, calm down. Like, afterlife exists. Because the second part, because he's a blank slate, I inserted myself. <laughs> you know what I mean? And 90% of shit I know about 9-11 is, like, comedy gifts and fucking 4chan memes. Right? <laughs> so, all the humor I would have done as an author would have been inside the fucking buildings. Right? Because when you, if you look at basic game theory and basic, like, you know, categories of empirical imperatives... You gotta realize what is the point trying to save them? Like I'm with I'm with Glory the Angel. I'm like I gave you the gift of like spending time with your family. You could have fucked your wife. She 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 blue balled him, right? She she says I'm not gonna have sex with you right now. Right? Last so chance. The day she's gonna she's gonna regret that yes. for the rest of her life. <laughs> this is exactly. your own good, honey. Right? I'm coming in hard. Yeah. <laughs> like as the church father said uh, during the schism wars, let God sort them out. And afterlife exists. Oh, I want to save people. For what? It's not the end. You're going to end up in the same fucking waiting room. Like, I mean, there's still earthly God suffering. I, we, I'm not going to... I, I don't know. I can't co-sign that just because it, there's a proven afterlife, therefore nothing in the world matters, it, or the suffering of their family. Uh, I, I don't think it diminishes to that extent. If you, oh, The family ends up like in the same I, place. Her kids are going like to die, too. Like I'm saying, like I'm saying... Should have just uh, should have just found someone to be a confessor. Found the biggest asshole in the building and been like, "All right, I know you're going to hell, <laughs> unless you talk to this guy." Wheel in the Padre. Yep. That's the thing. It would have been great if there was a lot more like a comedy instead of the whole labyrinth and like the Cthulhu, Lovecraftian cult thing with the with the circle and the labyrinth. Like if he did more stuff in the city, yet again, it's, well, it's but stage you're, I setting. Mean, if you look too close, I, I don't know, man. I, I feel like that spoils the allegory. Again, with the allegory, what as like yeah, the e- millennial each trauma. stage is another yeah, sure, part that's of the it. Point. And there's that's a looming the doomsday yeah. over the entire. Well, we've only read the first half, but over the next half too, there's a doomsday and, prophecy. And let's let's look at it this way. All right, so in in terms of story structure, let's say that he just falls into 
actually, you know what? Now that I'm about to say something and it's going to actually work, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> he falls into hedon- hedonistically reliving literally the past uh, in order to distract himself from the pressing concerns of uh, that are arising from the 9/11 attacks, uh, which which would, which would be which would case. be him. Uh, which would be him going out on the town and doing all of his paper things, et cetera, et cetera. And then it's like, well, that actually kind of works too. I was going to say that doesn't work at all, but it, it does kind of work because, I mean, society is kind of just doing that, right? Society's kind of yeah. just hedonistically reliving the glory days of, like, the monopolar world of the 90s rather than dealing with any of our current pressing concerns, which ultimately we really can kind of lay on 9-11, right? In terms of the, the sea yeah. change of, of, uh, of global politics and, and power structures. And it's, it's the first domino. It's a big-ass domino, but it's the first one. So, For him, it's the fall of Rome. It's the fall of Constantinople. It really yeah. is a giant cosmological event for him. His and I also, I it, also it, think, it represents a I also think you may have missed a little something with the columns. It could have been a, you know, sort of a Samson reference where he pushed down the columns and the temple falls. It's the fall of the temple. True, but but the twin columns and why would why would there be a Samson reference? I, I don't. He, for he, me, I thought it was more likely Atlas he, or Prometheus. Well, because when Samson because when Samson pushed down the columns, the temple fell. And the fall, the destruction True. of the temple is a is a, a major cosmological significance in yeah. True, and he does it, the, the twin towers are almost like a holy ground because he references them like gods. He even says like uh, when he feels the buildings coming down, they groan like ancient right. gods. You know, so I I kind of agree with you there. Yeah. But the only reason why I said that is because the demon, the men in black, sent them there. And if you notice on the phone booth, the demons literally say, I'll Prometheus your ass. I'll rip your organs out of your asshole every day sure, for an eternity. Sure. <laughs> they usually use that language. And again, he's very funny. Like, the um, um, Glory calls him a retard at one point. <laughs> <laughs> and Tom is like, wait, what? Why are you using the word? He's like, I'm trying to be down with the cool mortals, man. <laughs> isn't that, isn't that what you is kids great. say? <laughs> All right. Now that we spent half our time on the short story, <laughs> do you guys have anything else on uh, on this one? Um. Well, how about you, David? Did thing, you read it? Do you have any thoughts I to don't share? Anything else besides what I shared? It, it was short, to be honest. I have basically no notes on it. <laughs> so my notes are on on the novella because it was it, it was it went down smooth overall. I had a little bit of criticism towards the end. You guys take. You guys take notes? Yeah, um, yeah, I have my paper <laughs> yeah. notes right here. Actually, just Damn. You gotta be ready. All right, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just on. Wait, wait, I'm straight wait, so on memory, did, dog. So you I'm reading really... in the bathtub. <laughs> Can't take notes. <laughs> Base bath boys, bath boys. Let's go. But, but for real, David, didn't leave. It, it was no, for no, net positive. Huh? Let me rephrase that. Actually, it left a, it left a positive impression. I just don't have a lot of specific notes besides what I already mentioned. I have a I have a soft love for this one. It was again I like the pace. I thought I know the hitting the ground running mm. at the beginning was good but for bum. a hook, <laughs> but but he lost depth. But I, if, if you got like a little sense of like um, if you got some sense of like office life and like you could have more like a slightly bigger cast of characters and like you know the office dynamics and like with Chuck formerly you know and again I'm thinking more black comedy. Yeah, <laughs> formerly Chuck's absolutely suck and fuck and sneed and feed, right? Absolutely. <laughs> but overall, this high I, city slicker the love I have with his, with his fifty dollar yeah. haircut and his and towers his, and, and his manicure. <laughs> yeah, those towers. I bought these steel beams at uh, Barnes and Noble. I don't know where. <laughs> where? <laughs> <laughs> but overall, I'd say this shows, in, for like all memes aside, good. Absolutely great dialogue. The dialogue was perfect. Ga- uh, not yeah. Gabriel. Um, Glory was perfect. Wow. Um, wow. Self centered. <laughs> sorry, I self inserted. I self inserted as the angel, all right? Uh, angel respects well, angel, all right? This is a Christian podcast. <laughs> <laughs> talk but no, about for your real, I, I do think the dialogue. <laughs> I do think overall the, the dialogue was great. The very fast paced, the pacing was very good. And um, all the positives I have in this 
are completely non-existent in the second one, which I have a lot, a lot more to really? say. Really? Oh, you haven't said anything yet, Gabe, so I'm excited to hear you speak up a little bit and voice your thoughts. Um, <laughs> let's go. All right, let's move on uh, to the, the, the beef here of the two. The Holy Hunt. So the Holy Hunt, as in, by way of just general overview, it opens with uh, the, the creature, a young man from... I don't the name of the state. He's an American, travels to Mexico. Arizona. He's from, from Arizona. Arizona. Thank you. Travels to Mexico, gets drugged, dragged to a drugler's den. And what I think is a pretty banger first chapter um, sort of rips you through him being force fed drugs. Three years or so have passed. And then now he's this drugged out, mind blasted mess. And, uh, and, and we're talking, we're talking research chemicals. He's really, really really on the good yeah. stuff yeah he probably wasn't feeling pain for those three years he's on he's he's on the stuff with no no trip reports on arrowhead dude he's on fucking no one, he's on no fucking quaaludes on they're bringing him back and this guy is tripping balls dude yeah uh, mushroom uh jungle mushroom quaaludes and then he gets rescued they go to the island a lot of stuff happens there's a tribal conflict well he gets he gets re- he gets rescued and he completely he's but he's so burnt that he is basically a, a baby. He's like regressed to a nonverbal three year old yeah. mentally. Yeah. And then now he's in the the care of Sergeant Ashley, a, a sort of CIA spook type dude, uh, who's leading a, a few soldiers. They crash land on an island where there's this Unbeknownst to them, there's this tri- ancient tribal conflict, and so this is basically our our military adventurism uh, portion of the of the millennial experience carried over. I guess there's some Iraq allusions in some of the the terminology people use. I have yeah, I have a I have a ton of thoughts. I'm actually not even sure where I want to begin with this one. Um, well, let me open this way. I feel like I I very much like the first chapter. The second chapter, I started seeing some cracks, and then for me, this one totally dissolved in the last the last chapter, and it just became just sort of a, a speed writing exercise. Yeah, completely agree. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Go You're ahead. being far too generous, actually. What do I, what do I do? What do I do with all these loose? Why heads? didn't you make it longer? Know, that was my <laughs> thing. Like, just make this a book. <laughs> No, it's well, too fucking he, long. He it tracks like it a weird. Here's my okay. Here's my contention. Here, it's time for everyone to have a seat. It's time for David rewrites for the author, and it's perfect because it's in my head. Because um, I'm so perfect, blah blah. But why do we get blue balled on this invasion, and then it happens all at the end? He gets our POV gets clapped. Our semi POV. That's a whole other discussion I have. He gets clapped on the back of the head like a fucking Scooby Doo villain, and half the action happens. And then we 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 miss all the excitement, and then it's just it's just fucking that's the, 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 that's all, folks. It, it, it's it's like that should have happened. They should have invaded in the middle. There should have been like five nights of under siege and all this crazy shit, tribal warfare, colonialist, tribalist warfare references. There was so much exciting, cool there, but we end up having like. It feels like 20 fucking trips across the island, logistical discussions of who carries who, who has a bad ankle, walking here, walking there. You're so, and I'm just, I was fucking worn raw by all this walking. And then we get to the action and it just blows by in like two pages of this epic, like savage thing. And I thought of Blood Meridian. And when the Comanche show up in Blood Meridian, you have like two pages of their fucking war dresses rattling. You have bones and skulls and like a child's skull on a stick or something insane. And in this is just half paragraph or paragraph of them showing up in canoes and they have like red face paint or something. And that's it. And then it's just like, all right, and then getting well and then and then getting absolutely lit up, retreating. And yeah, <laughs> a paragraph for like each of these yeah. major maneuvers that we've been prepping for for probably like eight thousand pages. Right, that's my rant. I mean, my so again, like we should be, in my opinion, sort of interpreting this in the light of it 
it being an allegory. It's part of an overall project, right? So uh, the ending, uh, which which I will now spoil, is just that um, you know following a uh, a bizarre and entirely one sided romance from the smoking hot Latina I mentioned in the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> um our our brain damaged protagonist uh uh gets effectively raped by her uh <laughs> in the ocean <laughs> so I so yeah. i don't know if you've ever seen the film pumpkin <laughs> but a a smoking hot latina has sex with with an imbecile <laughs> and and she 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 literally fucks him back to sentience. <laughs> she like she makes it possible for him to speak again. Um, and then and then uh, and then instead of fucking his fu- brains she out, fucked his brains fucked in. Back You're in. right. Yes, she fucked his brains in. And um, and then and then she promptly dies off screen. Uh, and he gets on a canoe while everyone else is is fighting. Um, and uh, fucks off, and they're still fighting when he leaves. And there's this. Oh god, he gets a big bad stare down by the ripoff. Yeah, judge. yeah, by knock by by knockoff Judge Holden, uh, by neoconservative Judge Holden. <laughs> also, you know what? No, fuck you, fuck you, Cap. I had to sincerely say fuck you for hyping me up with neocon am... Judge Holden. I expected fucking you see, George Bush. You see, I was right. I was right. <laughs> But I was also misleading. <laughs> uh, oh fuck! It was so much worse. I thought it'd be like nice and happy. Oh god! Finish your rant, but man, but the I thing is this. that Just you know ahead, uh, basically I understand that thematically the ending had to be like that this this person who is bewildered um, and has gone through these these lost to seemingly lost years. Uh, is just bewildered and there's this ongoing conflict that is not resolved and you're literally adrift right like i mean that's the allegory right that the you know when this story was written the u.s was probably still in both of the countries that got invaded in the in the um mm. after 9 11 right so, uh, it's it's a in, interminable, uh, an interminable involvement uh, in in a con in an ongoing conflict. So, I'm not entirely sure. Also, what all of the I I, I, I try to map the characters, the the soldiers, and um, well, the, so the cast of character is Sergeant Ashley, our our. Judge Holden, uh, Kurtz, mm. yeah, Kurtz, uh, Rumsfeld combo, um, and Lazarus. Uh, then we have we have the doctor, yeah, we have we have the doctor who is a Colombian American linguist and chemist. Apparently, um, we have smoking hot Latina. <laughs> With a vocabulary just as dense as her father and Ashley, by a, the way. A muy picante, legal, <laughs> <laughs> legal Latina, um, and then about twenty soldiers. Uh, you don't remember and the names then, of. Then, La- then Lazarus, the the brain damaged guy. Mm-hmm. Then there is the medic, who is a a major character. I like Sabo. Sabo. He should yeah, have been the protagonist, Sabo. actually. Yeah, it makes no sense that and 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 Sabo is my actually my biggest complaint, uh, and then there are then there are several soldiers really? uh, who have various levels of characterization, but we can effective but we can yeah but Robbins we can effectively call fisherman? them the Marines mm-hmm. right, so, um, Sabo is my biggest complaint. I have difficulty, um. I have difficulty mapping Sabo onto anything of relevance. Is Sabo supposed to be a domestic resistance to neoconservatism? And he just gets, you know, he tries to 
violently rise up against uh, against Sergeant Ashley and is immediately <laughs> killed like a kitten. Like <laughs> I, I, I don't. I, did I miss that part? I, I read of, it not as a did I domestic miss that part of the Bush years, but, but like, like the more the moral soldier, and like basically you're going to get drummed the fuck out if you're complaining and calling out bullshit you shouldn't be. In in terms of the allegory, and then in directly in terms of the story, he basically is a retarded person when the plot demands it. And prior to that, he's the empathetic character. Yeah, I mean, I think I think he kind of wanted a. Um, uh, what was the character in Lord of the Flies? Uh, Sebastian, I think. He uh, and the 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 character who who sacrifices themselves, um, basically in who's yeah who is the moral center of the group, but. There's still no. That's Piggy, right? From Lord of the Fries. Lord of the Fries, no, 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 no. good one, Gabe. <laughs> Lord of the Fries. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the, the Amira Mutt. Those are Freedom my, Fries, my Gabe. Get it right. This out. is a millennial. Freedom Fries, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Hey, Jamie, can you look up who died in Lord of the Fries? <laughs> it was Simon. It was Simon. I only saw. I only saw the movie, uh, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, deeply embarrassing. Mm. That that's a fucking. I mean, you could read that book in an afternoon. <laughs> I know. I know. Isn't that? Lord of the Flies is as long as Holy Hunt, the second story in Millennium. Uh, if you're gonna read one, read Holy Hunt. You put that on the. You can put that on the back of the next one, Marty. I'm just <laughs> giving you that one. <laughs> put put that on the blurb. Um, yeah, it's it's just a character who needed. It did, didn't map great uh, onto onto anything for me in terms of the allegory and his because his uh, um, place in the story kind of came to naught and there was you still had the smoking hot Latina who was uh, who had a moral compass and the professor who kind of had a tarnished morality. Mm. Uh, it it wasn't clear to me what. We're actually missing some, and it adds to my follow on that there's just too many characters in this because there's also no one's fucking mentioned him yet, but he's essential to the first story, first chapter, and he's pretty keen the last. The drug cartel lord, of course, he, yeah, the the, the, the prince of the scare, the prince of the stars, yeah. He, the writer forgets about him. Philip just completely fucking forgets about him. Did you guys not? Did you guys not? I mean. So he disappears at following the plane crash. He's in custody in, uh, on the plane. Mm-hmm. He disappears. And it's it's obvious that he has survived and has a mm-hmm. gun. Right? It's obvious from, from that point. And I kept waiting for him to come back up. And the, in, the invasion happens, and sure enough, he's there. Um, nothing happens with that guy. Yeah, what he the literally fuck? just, I guess, swam across this huge... <laughs> gap of the ocean and just hung out and ingr- ingratiated himself to the natives like all right you're now our our captain or something <laughs> in their army i think it's marty builds him the fuck up he builds him up like a very mystique and it, uh, like and also he describes him almost like uh the demonic the demons in uh the first one what, the way he's, his voice sounds like crooked music or like almost similar to the way the demons spoke on the phone. He sets him up as his this. Mm-hmm. He even calls him like a warped version of a god when he when he first injects him with the drugs. You know, you can call me the the Prince of El Esquera, right? The Prince of the Stars. I'm like, oh shit! Like this is a man who took this man's life, who took our poor Lazarus before he became Lazarus. This character is such a big fucking deal to Lazarus. This is a man yeah. who took yeah. his life for all intents and purposes, and. He just fucks off and we get... Which is why cycles. my fan fiction, to go back to, to my, my fan fiction idea, and why <laughs> Sabo should be the main character, the first chapter, frankly, should be a flash fiction story or, like, a whole separate short story. We cut cut Lazarus the fuck out of this story, and then you should have Sabo or someone else just down shrink this mm-hmm. cast down by, like, three or four people and just really focus on Sergeant Ashley a Sabo-ish type character, maybe a different prisoner who's not a mental deficient, <laughs> and everyone. So you can actually focus on them, build them up, 
And then um, as a as a follow on to that, oh, a POV issue from my perspective. We have a overall sort of a third omniscient point of view, but it actually floats between right. third limited from Lazarus and into a third omniscient. And it does so in a kind of like, I don't know, springy, clunky way. Clunky. Yeah, Stilted. and it really causes so many so issues because Stilted. Lazarus is mentally like just not all there, especially to be early on. And then you have this grandiose, it's not like written grandiose, but you have this all seeing eye that sees what intents are behind things and all this. And you're like, wait a minute, am I seeing this through Lazarus? Does Lazarus know that Ashley is like insane in this way or that this soldier feels out of this way? Because he's literally on the other side of the beach or something. He's not even in this scene. And then it jumps back in. And all, all that to say, yeah, so the POV had this issue of, of shrinking in and out of um, limited to omniscient. And Lazarus and the drug cartel boss had this really rough connection with the overall plot. And so that's why, again, my fan fiction version would be trim that out or cut it out entirely and just focus on a band of soldiers and, and the rescued. You can... Yeah. You can cut out 80% of this. This is way too fucking long. <laughs> this is way too long. You, you, you know what this is? This is a hand job from a woman with a glove made out of sandpaper. That's what the fuck it is. Gablor! <laughs> we got some Gablor! <laughs> nice. Oh, God, no. I would fucking prefer Sandpaper oh glove hand this jobs. Is, Gabe, tell us more. Yes, that's what it is. <laughs> Listen. Uh, listen, I was waiting for this, man. I, my blood was fucking boiling with this. I have an apology to make, actually, to one T.R. Hudson. Fucking internet girlfriend who has more sexual chemistry than wherever the fuck happened Gabe, in this Gabe, story. I, I, was I so need to tell shocked. you that I, 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 here, I, here, I, here I must leave you, my son, because if you are telling me that you object to raising the very real issue of female latina teenage sex criminals in <laughs> taking advantage of the mentally handicapped then i have to say that you're on the wrong side of the issue and you need to you <laughs> No, no, it's a Greek tragedy. It's like Oedipus Rex. It's like, you know, Oedip Oedipus, Oedipus Rex got Oedipus fucked Rex for fucking his mommy. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yes. She got what was coming to him, right? Or coming mm -hmm. to her. But no. Okay, so I, dude, I was, I read this in a fucking Panera bread. And I, the first note I fucking have, notice that I, me and Dave had the exact same thinking with the fucking POV thing, right? So the first note, right? Distant formal tone. A verbal altercation, right? Because I first noticed this. If you notice, the tone was very casual. The dialogue was very casual, very natural in the first story, mm -hmm. right? But as soon as the, uh, the POV, the third-person narrator, the narrator describes the fucking creature, uh -huh. right? Lazarus, right? And it's third-person omniscient, and it's he tries to go for something, like, deeply, like, operatic and intense, and meaning and like how time doesn't work properly and um, here i am theory selling like oh the view on time if like the two stories have time like oh time is frozen or time doesn't work properly under millennials but, but no fuck that right because he starts bitching about like student loans and like oh i was not taught how to like do my taxes so he's trying to go for his deep deep tone this man is in a concrete box right drinking water from a crack on the ceiling <laughs> <laughs> right, and he's using this big, deeply important third-person omniscient pretentiousness to describe bitching about like m being raised as a millennial, and, like getting fights with his dad. Quote verbal altercation. All right, so this is the very first quote. Distant formal tone. My God, you know this is based on fucking Heart of Darkness, by the way. If only I known like like being in the natives at the front of the Congo. Oh, they seem nice. I wonder what it's like deeper down the river. The fucking horror, man. I actually, because I think I have deeper lore on it. I don't think it's Heart of Darkness. It's I'm not to censor. Thank you, YouTube, for making sense of this, and thank you for your your black heart, <laughs> Marty. It's it's inspired by the Nick Narcissus. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, wow. he did say that. I, I never read the heart. Uh, <laughs> okay. Either. Yeah, and that's why there's a you know Lazarus character huh. in my opinion. Well, he names drops Conrad. One of the soldiers right. that dies is named Conrad. First guy. Oh, yeah. I didn't think about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, the opening, the first. I agree with you. 
all like Wait, is the it? first no, 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 opening no, no. is great. I don't, it's like, Conrad doesn't die, does he? Is, isn't Conrad the one who gets kicked off the plane? He's like, get the hell out of here, Conrad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's yeah, one of the tattoos yeah. on his neck. I'm pretty sure, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's right. But the entire, I agree with Dave that the opening was great. It was intense. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, uh, the, it was so tight and focused. And you see, he gets, they shoot up this fucking compound, right? Bullets are flying. He gets dragged out into the air. It's rainy. Then again, he's great at setting scenes. I'm like, okay, I can see this. I can feel the tension. I can feel the energy, right? It's pumping. It's tight. It's focused. And then you see Ashley, the sergeant. And he is described exactly like Judge fucking Holden, right? Seven foot tall, big, blubbery ass white boy made of pure, like, fat and stone and steel and muscle. Wearing, like, a, completely wearing bald, a Speedo for some a reason. Head like a shark. <laughs> a purple Speedo. No, no. He no, describes like, it like a female. Like, yeah, like, like yeah, a woman's for, for bikini. For some reason. And he says, you know. He has atmosphere, and he's. I'm like, okay, this is Judge Holden knockoff, right? This is, I, I'm with it. I'm with him. The entire plane crash, right? As soon as the plane fucking crashes, you're still with it. There's a lot of tension. Oh my god, the Prince of the Stars is gone. We need to track him down. I'm like, okay, fuck it. This is like, this is just like Heart of Darkness, right? You got, you got a mix. The, the, all the setting is perfect. You got the judge mixing with Conrad. It's a great adventure story with a little bit of Robinson Crusoe. It's fucking great. And. I lost it. And I know it's a little bit wonkiness with the dialogue because the professor talks. So Because the whole point of... Yes, exactly like Ashley. Right? It gets worse as time progresses. Because the whole point of Ashley is that he talks a little weird, like very archaic, like uh, very formal, just like the narrating POV, by the way. And like everyone's, oh, he's eccentric. I'm, okay, yeah, he's the judge. He's trying to copy the judge. It's not as good, but, you know, I'm giving him credit, right? Then he talks to the professor. And it also oddly, like, stilted and, like, formal. And I'm like, okay, the professor, but okay, fine, whatever, right? And I, as soon as they, it's after they do the pits, when uh, the guy's like, fuck these natives, and then they meet the natives, he comes back there walking, and right when he first does the fucking Shadow the Hedgehog shit, where you see his big seven-foot-tall motherfucker slam this guy to the ground, <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? And he says, you know, I could kill you with a word. You know, I am, uh, you know, I can kill you with a mere word. I can, you cannot die. No matter what you could do, you could frag me and I cannot die. And as soon as I saw that, it's like being a kid and you notice, like, your dad's, like, dressed as Santa Claus. And you notice the beard falls off and you see his, like, his double chin. Or you Sorry, see a magic for the first time game. and the strings pop out. <laughs> 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 well, many such cases, right? But you see this and you realize, oh, shit. You know, it's an SNL sketch, right? And he, with Ashley is, it is a bad judge impression done by Shadow the fucking Hedgehog, right? Because <laughs> it, it's, it's an OC. I mean, he, yeah, he, no, he, obvi obviously he, he's because everyone he's, hypes yeah, him I up. Mean, he's the he's the fan fiction version of of Judge Holden and 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 Kurtz, but like, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that 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 being true though. I didn't hate it. I didn't hate it. I thought I thought the dialogue I yeah. thought the dialogue that I thought Every the dialogue time. that that Sergeant Ashley had was good. Like it was it was it was oh over my God. it was over Every time it was he opened over his mouth afterwards. The top as hell. But I I I didn't I didn't fail to enjoy it. I did not fail to enjoy it. Oh. And later on I felt like it was actually more fitting. Like as it, as the insanity ramped up and you became more convinced, this guy is completely fucking off his rocker. It was like more and more like, all right, this guy is becoming like a jungle king in his head, and, or you know, I'm an American, the spirit of America speech. Um, yeah, yeah, I would agree overall, and and I don't want to, I don't want to veer too much of negativity because I felt like there was actually a lot positive going for it in terms of much of the dialogue was good it was overly formal particularly with the professor even some of the soldiers slipped oh into don't get me started of, go. yeah go ahead okay you know here, here's a little trick for you boys and girls mm. i'm gonna ask you which character says certain things all right so we have let's do let's do the best one of the best dialogues okay here's a quote this is from ashley you had better hope that old man does not succeed in rehabilitating you if he does then it's your death sentence but not by my will I'm merely the emissary of a greater power, one made more perfect every day. He glanced over at a dark shape as the men around the fire. Their days are numbered, also, the crude beasts. 
I hold a base admiration for them and a sorrow for their fate. I will last a little longer because my purpose is more complex. Unlike those poor souls, my eyes were wide open from the beginning. Honor killing followed by honor suicide is the course of my existence. Like a self-deleting virus, I can only tell you this because you will never tell anyone else. One way or the other, he rose and stalked off into darkness. Okay, well, so that we got was a Sergeant baseline. Ashley. That's a pretty good line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, well, I said, said that, Sergeant Who yeah. said it? Oh, okay, okay. This is this is your control. <laughs> oh, no, Ash, Ashley. <laughs> all right, all right. Base, yes, control. Now, which character says this? How the hell does that odd fellow travel that precarious rock shelf from the cave with all that stuff in his arms? He must have the feet of a mountain goat. Dude, I, right? rem- I remember this fucking line, and yes, one of the soldiers, is re- which is yes. totally not fitting. Yeah. Uh-huh, a redneck fisherman said this. All well, right. that's some right. odd fella. Bo- uh, okay, and here's another one. I wish I was like you, unburdened by knowledge, free from sin, and loved by God. You're the only one I can speak with complete honesty. Isn't that a paradox? That the man, untouched by language, is the most honest and most trustworthy? Maybe you'll talk again someday, and you can tell people I wasn't blank. All right, I, and then wait, the next one. I, I, I made a list for this. Uh, what? I, 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 oh, I'm okay, okay. avoiding obvious spoilers. Yeah. As to their identity. Well, identities. that was the professor. <laughs> More like... It a, wasn't. Nope. Uh, I know it was the Hamlet girl. of Nebraska. Hamlet. Oh, wait. Oh, Hamlet really? of Nebraska, actually. Oh, okay. Remember oh, Sabo's from go. Nebraska, right? He's a redneck boy from mm. the plains. Okay. Mm-hmm. Here's another one for you. Ah, I suppose I'm like you, except I have words, which are futile and meaningless. Perhaps that means that I'm even more wretched. You must think that I'm a ridiculous creature, if you have thoughts, that is. That was cruel of me to say. You are all I have left. You are so good to me that you can't even well, lie or disappoint girl. me. Of That's course, you won't reveal. Yeah, yeah you're cute. doing a, you're doing the, the girl <laughs> build. I'll, I'll know I'll know what I'll know what Gabe okay, yes, I'll know I, what Gabe I, sounds I, like if he ever <laughs> decides to start cross dressing. Yeah, does it trap you? Yeah, Gabe Gabe with a Y. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but but you notice you had to rely on me fucking like being like some no, like, I actually, femboy to do I, it. I, I did recall mm-hmm. that right. dialogue and, and not liking it. Yeah, but you think, here's the thing. At a certain point, he just kind of gives up giving other characters like styles of tone and voice. At first, it was just a professor who talked to like oddly academic and stilted, same kind of way as Ashley. But fucking Robbins, the fisherman redneck, the fucking Lazarus, the POV. Right, the narrator talks like this. The narrator goes on a rant at one point. It's not Lazarus. It goes on a rant about life and, like, cosmos and existence and morality. And it just goes on a fucking rant. It's not related to Lazarus at all. It's the same style of tone. The whole point of Ashley is you're, you're, you knock off... Every time Ashley talks, he speaks, it's a one-third chance of one. Either A, bad impression of Judge by Shadow the Hedgehog. One, neocon commentary. Two, Liberal, woke, military, well, uh, diversity is our well, strength. Except, globalism I mean, commentary. So there's a there's a smooth, there's a there's a very smooth transition between neoconservatism and neoliberalism, right? So like, right, but they, they definitely had a different tone back in 2008. This is not a Bush era neocon. He talks like sure. either Sergeant Milley, you know, white man, white yeah. terror. At one point, but he's the soul they, of he it. Talks he's not a literal. Yeah, no, like, I mean, it, it kind of it kind of makes sense. He's yeah, he's he's a moral relativist who's only interested in exporting Americanism, whatever that is. No, it's the opposite. The world, he even says, the America does not belong to the world. The world belongs. No, that sorry, vice versa. The world does belong. Um, the America does belong to the world. He's a globalist. The reason why he fetishizes these natives, right? Because he has his fantasy of a manifest destiny, but in an odd globalist way, where he, it's all about progress. Mm. You know, what he represents is progress, actually. Because when he has that, I'm not so different, you and I, with him, he knows like, we have no past, right? He says we have no past, we're only in a constant premise, uh, presence. Um, but yeah, so he says, you know, we are in a constant future, and he talks about we have no heritage, it, it's constantly progress, constantly moving forward. Yeah, permanent revolution ideology, but in this military adventurous sort of uh, yes. facade. 
<clears throat> I do want to be, I don't be careful not to spiral into just a negativity thing. Cause I do think there was some good redeeming stuff in terms of, uh, the suspense of it. And that's actually what blue balled me so hard about the ending. I got pretty fucking pumped actually in the build up to the end when they knew that they were coming fucking long. They dragged it on and on and on. There's a, there's a saggy chapter, like three era. I think it was like, so chapter two, they crash land they get established and then like chapter three and four I, I should have written out what happened each chapter in broad strokes but they just traipse back and forth on the island like five times yeah, and they he meet loses the natives. all sense of pace yeah. and then the, when he the sex scene oh my god uh, you go ahead sir I'll, I'll, I'll continue on after you make your point no no it just it, it, and then he gets squeezed at the end because I feel like he's trying to make up for lost time so anyway I just want I wanted to mention that as a positive because we've been spirally negative which is fun and, and it's good to do i don't want to i don't want to be just um you know patting on the back or anything but i do want to call out the good stuff as well yeah but the thing is all the good stuff that was in the first story right excellent dialogue like mm -hmm. i thought ashley would be like a bad an evil version of glory from the first story right he, he's a character in the know Right, he he knows how to put you in the like uh, the POV of the main character. Who, again, Lazarus is also an action figure. Really, we, you you try to like give him like a arc, but it doesn't really work, you know, because of the POV problem you diagnosed. But uh, I thought actually would be he's in the know, right? He knows more than that we do, and the protagonist does. But then it just flies off the fucking rails, right? Because like here's another quote, right? That flag means justice of slight. Uh, sorry, that flag means justice of the purest form, not the kind found in dusty old books or made faint by the countless vitiations and redefinitions, not even the kind argued in the courts or handed by judges, but only kind that fundamentally matters, for the weak to kill the strong who seek to exploit their weakness. This is by the judge monologue. This is by the guy who's modeled after the fucking judge, right? And so he's a he's not a neocon. Like he's half commentary on neocons. And I mean this literally. I don't mean this in like a fucking <clears throat> clickbait way. He is a literal social justice warrior. Ah. This is a, the definition of like the classical social justice. No, no, I'm, I'm not meaning it. I'm meaning yeah, meaning yeah. It. No, 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 he's, a, he's like a Trotskyist no, in a sense. Saying. Yeah. Well, but neoconservatism yes, is Trotskyism. It, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And that he's embodying it by saying we have to have permanent revolution of the weak against the strong, and we're gonna, like basically whoever that is, there's going to be a constant. Yes, and tumult. it's anti Nietzsche. It's anti like. It, I'm like I'm looking at this. He even kill someone while naked. Like the like yet again. I I'm sorry for the, all the judge comparisons, but when you model him almost one for fucking one, and his dialogue, some of the good dialogue mirrors the fucking judge. It's hard not to make this point. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so bizarre because even like uh, after the shadow of a hedgehog slamming the man down and saying you can kill him with a word, which implies he's a demon, but then. But it's revealed that he's like a like a Jason Bourne clone, or like a not a clone, but like a fucking like a super soldier kind of thing, right? He he talks so mystical and he makes reference to gods and so forth. So is it? He says all these stories are of One Piece. So I know these are technically a separate well. To be story, fair, there's so many chapters it, of One Piece that it probably contains the majority of other stories. Mm, so true. I know. <laughs> so it's just. Where's that redhead chick? <laughs> They're on an island. Fuck. Yeah. yeah. So it, they, when the, <laughs> the plane got in a storm and it crashed on the Grand Line. And he he ate the, the Judge Judge fruit. And so he got the powers <laughs> of Judge Holton. Oh, dude, yes. It, it, is, it is so fucking horrible. And like he, he like criticized him for using the word savage. Like, you see this. like How dare you say that about Iraq my child pride? In freedom. <laughs> yes that actually was kind of a hot like section i'm not gonna lie in terms of more more white on brown action yes the child bride part was okay i can expect that <laughs> oh, you know to do what that, right I, I, i'm but... sorry I, I i i have to correct something that i said earlier i said the only love interest was a smoking hot latina but apparently there was also this native nine-year-old <laughs> prepubescent <Yeah>. native <laughs> <laughs> whoops that actually, I actually, oh. yeah, I thought that part was pretty fitting, and I liked the little touch that she made a shitty flag for them that they were flying under. Um, no, that's good. I like that quite nice part because it, it, if you notice, it doesn't fly in the wind. 
It's limp and it holds down, right? It doesn't even fly in the wind. It's very pathetic. Actually, I know the, the native depiction overall. I thought was actually strong. Like I liked the way they were. They were the, they were the only ones who seemed like they had any idea. What, like, they they were the most competent ones, in a lot of ways. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And the thing is, they fucking you. He has the painting of the islanders attacking them, right? And the fucking the professor translates them that oh, it's the coming of the renew cycle. I'm like, okay, well, obviously the fucking ask him about why the fuck is there a painting of a second island, people coming from that second island, attacking the first one. That one of the soldiers makes a one-off line, and it takes like ten fucking pages to like, oh, to reveal the obvious fucking thing. Mm -hmm. Take out the fucking painting. Like, because if you want your reader to actually pay attention, they would have predicted that ten pages of fucking ago. They should have been chapter four. They should have been like, have it, everything resolved and now we're building a fort or like yeah it, it would just happen so late and i wanted to before we get to off track i want to talk about just writing style some more i mentioned how it's conrad-esque obviously in terms of topic because it's like islands and there's a little bit of boat stuff or whatever but in terms of um you know writing style and it might just be me i'm not a huge fan of conrad's writing style but there was a lot of explaining or of telling and then we see it so there was a few references i have them bookmarked i'm too lazy to pull them up where so they'll say like J- joe schmo got his rebuttal in and then like it it gives the rebuttal or you know i i'll pull up an example later of it but the more sp- the the larger one for me was the lack of specificity so the example I have here was in chapter two when it really kind of hit me. This was a theme from the prior one to some extent, but it really was much more noticeable. The first story that is uh, in the first chapter, this was totally fine. But in chapter two of the Holy Hunt. OK, even in the sparse covering of trees, the island teemed with life. Tiny animals moved everywhere among the dead, the dead fallen palm fronds and for me, that's kind of emblematic of it. So he refers to it as tiny animals moved everywhere. And there's just a total lack of specificity there. Am I supposed to be so in the audience or the theater of the mind? In the theater of the mind, am I supposed to be imagining tiny pink elephants crawling over you know, the, between the palm trees? Are these insects? Are these lizards? Are these jaguars or the tiny jaguars? <laughs> What's meant by <laughs> tiny animals there? And Teacup, th- this, this sounds really petty, I'm sure, but it, it probably 90% of the descriptions, if not more, I would say are extremely general, um, not always to this level. But again, like when we first see the natives, we come and see the natives they are just described as like bronze skinned or something. And then when we see the natives again, um, I have that bookmark, I'm too lazy to pull it up. When we go see the natives on the day of the, the final day, they're wearing, described as wearing white and red flowers. And that's it. And it's like, dude, this is like a wild tropical environment. I should be like smelling them. I should be seeing like the, hearing about the woven texture, like what kind of reed mats are they making clothing out of? All this like really juicy detail that's missing. And that's to some extent sort of a Conrad's writing style as well. But Conrad has a great specificity and a huge lexicon of, of sailor and boat terminology. He's talking about, you know, sitting on the poop with your bros, you know, climbing with a marlin hook up a, up a mast. All these really specific terms that put you in place. But here, it's just an island. And I don't feel that passion for the island and like the jungle ecology or the military either. And so it's like, okay, what, like, what is, what am I falling in love with in the scene? Like, what am I smelling and tasting? Yeah, it creates this lack of sensory detail over a lot of it, where it's so much is, is very summary in terms of the descriptions. And it, it, got, it got very wearing over the course of the story. Um, and it's not always I that 100% level. I 100% agree. Yeah. I 100% fucking agree. Because well, to be fair, the first story wasn't prose porn either. He's very, he is always very skimpy. I think the most detailed mm-hmm. was actually describing, um, uh, describing Glory's suit. Uh, the blue, the the uh, the nice touch of the tie being a sky and a sun, mm-hmm. uh, of the the outfit of uh, Glory when he appears to him as like a mortal. That was, that was the most detail oriented thing in there. Here, I didn't expect um, like prose porn. I, I, he's very vague, you know. It, it it feels like, to be honest with you, if I was an editor, 
I would say cut out every single fucking thing for the most part after the plane crash. Because, like, the prince just pops out of fucking nowhere. Yes! <laughs> yes! Do it again! Can I say fucking yes? I'm not, I'm not gonna apologize for that, right? The NATO things takes way too fucking long, right? And the quality of the writing just goes fucking down the toilet. Like, I already showed you the problem with the dialogue. Mm -hmm. At a certain point, midway through, everyone starts sounding the fucking same. Uh, if, if you remove the, like, the dialogue tags... You can mistake Ashley for the professor, for the narrator, for Lazarus, for fucking Sabo. It drove me up the fucking wall. And Ashley is portrayed as this fucking figure of doom, right? Everyone in the story does, but you just disconnect, right? Because he's not mm. very good at description. It's very vague. Yet again, you, you can... All you did was like, Far Cry 3. I just mentioned Far Cry 3's beach, because yet again, it's very vague. He doesn't talk about the sand or like the tree line or anything. He describes the water a little bit and the moon, but that's about it. All you know is generic island and generic island. That's yeah. basically it. And I don't think and you all need to do the crazy characters look research. The same. Just even just like a Wikipedia of any Costa Rican island or whatever, and just like dive into those kind of details, or even just even technical terminology. Well, except of course, except the. They were all dead already. I was so scared that was going to be it, dude. Or the big reveal was it was all a dream. I mean, I kind of feel I I kind of feel like it, it was taking place in a in a non real setting since they were apparently an uncontacted island that had been cut off since the like <laughs> since pre Columbian yeah. times or something in era. So it's possible, yeah. Yeah, so they were, yeah, I mean, so, you know, they were in, in this strange, uh, strange world out of time, uh, to borrow a title, but... Literally, because remember, um, one of the Conway, yeah, yeah. character Conway, the math nerd, he says, you know, the North Star isn't right. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the, the constellations don't work right, so they're, they're in a they're cosmologically in it's a, in a time disconnected warp. place. The, 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 the idea mean, of time being fucked is carried through. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're in some sort of weird vortex. And so, you know, it's completely plausible that they're all in limbo or, you know, whatever. Uh, well, yeah, well, it's it's a, it's frozen in time. It's, it's uh, they're LARPers, right? The uh, natives are LARPers, right? It, the lore of the, of the natives are kind of fun. What? Right, there used to be. A, this is basically their version of Alcatraz. They're, they're prisoners of a former empire. The empire faded away. Now, basically, it's doomed to repeat. Where the neighboring islands come every fifty years or something like that to kill as much as they can as a little punishment of a curse. And it's the they predict that a giant white man will come and save them and lift the curse, which is obviously. God, Ash. I wish that were me. <laughs> yeah. You know what? There's little. There's less. You can't get a nine-year-old, Dave. <laughs> no, we get we get Ashley naked, but we don't describe. Imagine his describing his form in the rain. The, the visuals and again. Sometimes he's good at setting. When he finally kills like uh, the seamer. It's like a giant pale python. Yes. Coiled around his feet. <laughs> Imagine like a mix of a whale and a snake and like a shark. That would have been like and, like blubberously bloody and. I kind of imagined him as being strong, fat. Yeah, same, like Kingpin. You know, like Kingpin, like, a, yeah. like like a guy who doesn't care about his. Uh, I I refuse to make a Marvel reference, but like a guy who's <laughs> who's who like has a combined powerlifting total in excess of fourteen hundred, but also like you know, <laughs> like like anyone with the powerlifting total in excess of fourteen hundred does not care about his body fat percentage. And also, he's obviously got a fucking hog. So yeah, yeah. his, his visuals still describe yet again his character. Like I'll, I'll quote him one more time. <laughs> you see, we have to die for America to change, and America must change. To cease changing is total death of the nation, because America itself is changed. So he represents, you know, to quote the good Lord uh, Boswell, you know, the devil was the first Tory, or in other words, mm -hmm. the devil was the first progressive. I don't mean this even in a political sense. I mean this in, like, he constantly wants to die. He, in the other part, I can't find. He says, uh, it's not about history. Men, the future belongs to men with no history, like you and me. Like uh, Lazarus, because he suffers from the same thing as him. Like, uh, we're a higher human beings. We're constantly moving forward. Constant progress. Constantly moving forward. We're people of an eternal present. And uh, the narrator describes it as a 
as a positive, by the way. He says Lazarus is fundamentally innocent because, you know, comprehension kind of le- loses to innocence. He kind of makes a pseudo-platonic comment about since uh, Lazarus can't name anything, it doesn't know any concept of words. Words lead to sin, and he's kind of in a perpetual state of innocence. And so that was kind of interesting, right? He, it, it's a positive version of his progress because the judge knockoff, Ashley, is a, per- a state of perpetual present. You know, he's part neocon, and he makes this like, you know, he has part one, I heart Israel, and I heart trans rights, and Kmart judge Holden knockoff, right? So he represents this two... Crit- Wait, I thought you were a Zoomer. How the hell do you know what a Kmart is? Uh, well, in my neighborhood... I'm sensing inconsistencies. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I uh, used to play in the parking lot of an abandoned Kmart. I remember com- I remember even the commercials a little bit. Uh, but anyway... Uh, the ruins. Yes. Yeah. Like, yes. The before times. Uh, the ruins of mil- the millennium, right? But no, he represents... That's this true. ...constant progress. And... It's just... Ah, uh, you know, he is, he is supposed to be this figure of doom. And the thing is, he the prince doesn't come up. The, he sets up the prince, wastes the setup. I kind of agree with you. He basically comes back, literally shoots a random native. Doesn't even shoot one of the soldiers or even the girl. He just yells, "Fuck you!" Yes, no, <laughs> fuck you, American faggots. I fear I picked the winning side. Apparently, he's like, "Hey, I, the author remembered to put me in the very ending." You know, I totally did not come here to second draft. You know, <laughs> yes, he should have shot the bitch. He should have shot the Latina, right? Because this man ruined his life, right? She dies off screen. That's so true, because she died right after anyway, so why yes. not? Why not just have the man, the man who took his life to begin with, she restarted his life, and then the man who took his life takes it again, <laughs> basically. It loops. Yeah, yeah that would have worked better. It, yeah, it I mean, it wasn't even clear what her injury was actually Yo. in there. She was just, she was just dead. No, it, you know? no, her head rolls off her father's chest, and the father. No, it wasn't. Yeah, but it wasn't like it was bounce. It, like, <laughs> it didn't bounce away. <laughs> I, yeah, it didn't like bounce away. I don't think she got <laughs> decapitated. I'm pretty no, sure. No, no, her, you know, she's her laying neck, on top of her, her father's chest. Limp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she was just limp. Yeah, yeah. Just Padme condition. And you know, I love the fact he, you know, this dying. Uh, she died of a man. broken heart. You know, he goes from <laughs> weeping uncontrollably on his wife, on his daughter's corpse, to giving a monologue backstory, you know, to Lazarus. Like, yeah, yeah. Here's why you probably guessed I'm here. I'm just going to confirm it now, right before I die too. Yeah. Um, I know. I know. I'm a. Li- I know. I'm a linguist, but I'm also an experimental chemist. <laughs> No, maybe that was a cover. I think maybe that was a cover story. Like a he seemed to know a lot about it. Well, he about had, dorsal he, pathways he, and he had to be. A, yeah, he he was trying speech therapy. Why would he know speech? I mean, he <laughs> no, no, but and he spoke. He spoke Aztec. Well, he described the biological. So he was obviously yeah, that's pretty hardcore. Like, yeah, so he yeah. was, but he was he was obviously he had to be both. He was he was the he was the professor from Gilligan's Island where he's an expert in all kinds of everything <laughs> every any academic discipline that is currently required like the professor knows. No, he's so. more true to Judge Holden because remember Judge Holden in Blood Moon and he knows everything. He knows botany. He knows Spanish. He knows science. Yeah, he knows but, chemistry. But unfortunately. But unfortunately, he didn't build a fucking radio out of a goddamn coconut. <laughs> true. Oh, fools. Fucking true. Actually, you know what? I think we're missing the literary reference here, because Judge Holden could be, or not Judge Holden, but Sergeant Ashley is really kind of more of the Skipper and Thurston Howell, um, and obviously Smoking Hot Latina, who t- definitely has a name in the book. <laughs> Just to be clear, uh, definitely Anna. has Anna. a name. In the- yeah, Anna. All right, Smoking Hot Latina. Good to have that confirmed. And. Uh, <laughs> Her, so she's obviously a, a ginger, right? She's a ginger. Is she um, ginger? And no, no, no. She's she, ginger from Gilligan's Island. Oh, Zoomer! Jesus Christ! Watch Naked Night. <laughs> Zoomers. And <laughs> and um and the professor is of course the professor, and mm. Lazarus is Gilligan. Gilligan, yeah, hundred percent. So um, we missed it. We missed it. I have to admit that we missed it. 
uh, it took us this long, and um, we had to associatively get there. But it was a meta commentary uh, all is, along. This is a mashup of Blood Meridian, Gilligan's Island, and, and a pinch of, uh, Heart of Darkness. A pinch of Conrad. Yep. Well, and and the uh, the that that fine, upstanding, melanated gentleman of Narcissus. <laughs> <laughs> the seasoner of Narcissus. He he he, he yes. does his job of seizing the chicken. The the chicken washer <laughs> of the narcissus. <laughs> that fellow. I can't I can't keep hold of this slippery slippery chicken all this storm, Captain. It's too hard. He drops the chicken in the ocean. <laughs> just, just put the dawn right in the sink. God damn. That's that's literally just to that's literally just to trigger the pale ones. I gotta yeah. tell you. <laughs> I know. Nobody yeah, just... fucking does that. <laughs> deep lore it, yeah you gotta you gotta bait those ice walkers into uh into a rage yeah. like those male monkeys <laughs> all right anything we missed i'm trying no, to, i'm going over my notes now uh, i would like to mention the sex scene right I, this is where I, I would like to apologize to tr hudson here's a wonderful banger quote she rose into a sitting position reaching down to her waist and crossing her arms before sweeping her hands up over her head to remove her t-shirt the paleness of her skin in the moonlight and the shadowed contours around her small breasts indicated an alluring topography. Yeah, I remember that topography <laughs> line too. I was like, why? I was losing my fucking mind. Oh. All right. Well, I have I have a little <laughs> cap lore to tell you. Oh, I love the I didn't find that weird at all because I read maps all the time as part of my real life. Oh, and God. I that did not strike me as strange at all because sometimes I will discover a certain alluring topography <laughs> in a site mm. plan and I will be like, oh, this is actually very interesting. <laughs> and that's my... <laughs> Cap lore. Hey, her body's her wonderland, man. She's the blueprint. I mean, calling her pale, let's be honest, that's a cope. She ain't pale. Yes, they're, they're, she's not brown, but I thought she was a Latina, right? But both her... Well, she is. Well, yeah, but uh, he knows, by the way, he, to keep his white identitarian cred, he, she's a pale Latina. <laughs> At least by moonlight. In the silvery yeah, light, she's pretty pale. In the silvery light of the moon, everyone is pale. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you ever notice? You ever notice how uh, an Eritrean girl is the most reflective in moonlight? So really, really, they're the palest, aren't they? Sure. Aren't they? Butter the them East up. Africans. <laughs> we was. Hey, man. I'm just saying, if if you're if you're gonna cut yourself off from all of the <laughs> as, the assorted flavors of of female, I don't I don't really care about how many words you got. There's just no way you're going to talk yourself out of just being gay. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I'll be honest with you. If, if, uh, you know what? I'm going to take the gay card. You know why? Because this sex scene was so bad. Like, it was a little bloodless, right? It, it was so distant. The voice, the, the mean voice has in style. It's... Are you saying she wasn't a virgin? Oh, yeah, obviously. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, she obviously wasn't a virgin, right? She slept with, like, two guys. As soon as her first man dies, Sabo, right? She jumps on the, a literal unit, like, a retard that dick. That is... That is kind of womanish, though. Let's be real. True. Like women, so true. Especially thing. if they're under like panic mode, you know. They're just like, all right, whatever the fucking. She would probably get more of one of the Chad's troops, though. Must be real. True. Not this but, retard. But, but you this know, is like the. This I mean, this is the what's the Flor the Nightingale the Florence Nightingale uh, complex. She just she just had to mm. had this she had the project boys. Right? Yeah. She she likes the non threatening project men. Yeah, you think the, the, her, her dynamic with the men was great because, like, the one of the last times the soldiers talked like regular people was when they were talking about the tits of the natives. And, and one guy physiognomy mm -hmm. checks her. He just does a full like physiognomy check. Like, oh, why do I like? Why do I like natives? He just he describes the skull structure of their noses and their shape. <laughs> that was great. That was uh, oh, some of the good dialogue. Yeah, you know back. what? That was maybe that was maybe the. The most antelope hill uh -huh. conversation. The physiognomy the part, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Skull oh, there's, there's, why are, why are they, <laughs> Why do I find, they're skull about, shapes. What, so Mitchell and Webb, look, what about pure Aryan skull shape? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, but those are usually, 
more better enjoyed with the skin on. <laughs> <laughs> Or, or when they start dancing, like they got drunk and like they start uh, singing, da- singing in the rain, and like as like they sit around the campfire, like that was good. Like all, all that, but again, that's all in the early part. As soon as like the first maybe what fifty pages were good? No, 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 that's almost half. Maybe thirty pages. I don't know. Like as the beginning scenes were so good, and I agree with David so much. But as soon as they go back and forth, he describe after he falls into the pit, and they go back and forth. It just loses yeah. all momentum. The judge holding character is revealed to be a puppet, a character, a sketch. And see, he just... I mean... Pop off. I feel like there was... Uh, some of it... Some of it was good for building tension, especially, um, you know, as there was like this sort of... Um, this sort of discovery of what was going on. But, I mean, I do I do agree. It could have... It could have progressed. It could have been edited down better. Oh. Like, it, yeah, like this two outings. I, I really something. don't think you know. I don't think it's fair to say that you know post plane crash total rewrite. I don't. I don't think that's really fair. I think. Well, where would you think that I think that a quality. Well, I, I think that no. I mean, I just think that I think that quality quality editing and better use of um. And, and better use of the drug lord really could have patched most mm-hmm. things up. I also think that the another way to have potentially done this was would have been to just make it three sequential short stories. You could have had, I mean, you could have had like the the first one pre plane ride the second one on the island and the last one the war right i agree mm-hmm. well you're saying he's making a sequel to this by the way remember in the interview he says oh i have a plan for holy hunt too <laughs> yay i what interview the prudentialist one i haven't listened to that yet no i was i was actually um i i saw that it existed but i uh, didn't want to listen to it until I'd read the whole thing. No, I want. So. You know, by the I, I listened to it before reading this. By the way, Holy Hunt is his favorite out of the entire collection. By the way, so it's all down here from here, kids. <sighs> Gabe, why did you give me this curse knowledge? <laughs> the horror, the horror. This is your heart of darkness. This is just the beginning of the Congo, bitch. Just you're just telling me, telling telling me the the spoily spoils that that actually hurt. Oh. I think it's the, one of the challenges of our scene, though, because a beta reader, because people just don't have beta readers, and I think a, a beta reader, a good one, or a dozen, ideally, would identify these. In the Chudlet scene, it's only alphas. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, alpha and sigma alpha readers, readers, alpha and sigma <laughs> readers who just, you know, really, really, like, mow through some books. Yeah. Uh, you know, they don't even, they don't even think about editing or rewriting. Uh, it's just the L. Ron Hubbard method yeah. where if it's on the page, it's on the page. And if you don't like it, well, I guess you probably have some fucking thetans all packed up in your in your butt. So Yeah, dude, we keep it vital. We keep it raw, man. It's, if, if, if you can't recook cum, man. It, like, orgasm is an orgasm. You can't re-eat that shit. What the fuck? I'm, steal- I'm putting a bumper sticker. Uh, my Gay Blore! <laughs> can't reheat cum. <laughs> <laughs> or it's writing as orgasm, man. That's the true proper way to write. As it is flow, you gotta let it flow. Yeah. Yeah, but then all how right. do you turn the how do you turn the page of the manuscript if they're all, all stuck right. together? I it really got my blood pumping before the wet fart ending. Like when they were when they were like, oh, this is happening. We're building a, a fort. And the guy was ranting, and to me it was like, "Oh wow, this is like getting real." I was like, "Wait, the ten pages left. <laughs> what's what's going to happen?" I I so this is a case where I think my my read on this is that this is a stylistic choice because the conflict is kind of interminable and ongoing, mm-hmm. right? So th- this is just my my thought in terms of the way the 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 purpose and the concept of this of the book um and i mean i think i think allegory is a limitation 
I think allegory is a, a really significant limitation on the writing. Agreed. And I think that if it was, um, and I, you know, like this is the project he wanted to do. So that's, that's fine. It's, it's fine that he would have done it. And I, I think it's conceptually still quite interesting, but I think that it, the story structure and certainly the way that, certainly the way that the Holy hunt ended, um, it, it did not end better for the allegory, basically. Because he's still he's um, still trapped by like millennial as captive, right? Because the ending lines of Lazarus, right? The ending lines of the story reflect the idea of like you know the future denied of him, right? The, uh, he hopes to live the future that was once denied of him, right? Because uh, he 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 yeah. harps on this thing about the millennials have a denied future that uh, millennials as hostage, right? You know. Literally, even though the protagonist, Tom is not a millennial because he's a adult man with a wife in 9-11. I think he's an Xer, right? But it still applies. Uh, these men are frozen in... He's pubescent, right? He's basically a virgin, right? Because he's literally a eunuch. What is a eunuch? It's a permanently prepubescent boy, right? They, uh, eunuchs don't go through puberty, right? But that's Wait, what, who's a eunuch? Lazarus. Basically, for all intents and purposes, he was a eunuch all the way until... Oh, because he's got shot shot back to being a baby yeah yeah yeah. Yeah, basically that's what i'm saying right so it's it's the idea of being developmentally stunted right tom is an overgrown boy as well because he he doesn't really think about anything about anything deep or meaningful until the very end with with angel and same thing here he's literally developmentally stunted right in terms of mental maturity he he opens up with a monologue that's straight out of like bo burnham about you know I was not taught what laws they were. I was not taught how to do taxes. And the ending, you know, he you you could have ended with him just. This is the time to actually try to do some prose. Like all of this shit happens. The the holy war happens, right? He's staring daggers into fucking um, Ashley, right? How does this end? The woman of his dreams, the woman who brought him back to life, has died. And how do you end this story? It ends with a wet fucking fart, and nothing meaningful is said. Uh, you you end up you end up literally and figuratively adrift. Yes, it just it fucking ends. It just he just stops the play button. But the problem is, and that's why my again, my fan fiction is there's like three or two or three clashes between the two tribes that are like indeterminate in their ending, and then maybe he could drift off or whatever. Because the problem is, is like this: there's the battle still going on. Someone's going to win or lose, and so it'd be more it'd be even more metaphorically interesting if it was a stalemate in some way and he was the man i don't know yeah, you know, okay, here's a direct uh, quote he hoped beyond all reason that ashley had been some unique artifact and not what he could expect from his future an aberration seen as strange by a world far more decent a world that would accept him and that he could live in happily and love in return mm-hmm. like a commentary on like what the f- this is an entirely different dimension like this is it like he, he hopes the woman of his dream has just died it, it, every, everyone he knows just has fucking died and he feels hopeful in the end <laughs> paddling a canoe into oblivion into the w- wide open you see what ocean. happens with the other people with the two guys that got canoed right they get fucking they got fucking gang banged by Flayed fucking porcupines and... <laughs> actually I like that description by the way Basically. another shout out <laughs> yeah well I mean he's not gonna get He's he's not going to get you know flayed because uh, everyone's busy f- in the ten on one against Sergeant Ashley. Also, and also apparently yeah. Lazarus has superpowers because stroke gripping the spear, Lazarus ran straight into him, punching the head through the middle and feeling a hot spray of blood on his hands. So yeah, so he just blows up. A- yeah, he got strong at the end, out of fucking nowhere. That's great. <laughs> yeah, retard strength. <laughs> yeah, it's canonical. obviously canonical retard strength come on it ends with him having a commentary on Ad- basically the fucking commentary on neocon and woke lib and how much he wants to the world to accept him and to live a happy life that he was promised it ties back to the opening monologue that was basic millennials complaining about fucking like student loans and there's no other way to read yeah. the ending it's 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 millennial whining. I'm sorry, but that's the what the ending line basically means. As Lazarus drifted away, he hoped that his student loans had not 
capitalize their interest and that he was still on forbearance after all these years. Literally. Is there any other way to interpret this shit? All right. Let me just close out my my last thought on it. I do. I, I just agree with Kev. You made an interesting point about maybe splitting to three stories. Hypothetically, that would have been more entertaining maybe one of the jungle where like they're chasing i don't know why i always resort to these fan fictions of like when i have <laughs> issues with it but like resolve it with the drug lord in the jungle and then go on the then go to the island and then have an islander battle or something i don't know just there's so right. many ways it, it needed yeah, they, they find him first and then it, yeah it just it needed some editor and or beta readers to be like there's some co- really cool ideas here there's a couple of really great sections but it's just not flowing well so yeah like a, a, a second pass yeah i could have done wonders i think on, on the skeleton here yeah and focus on like the main characters like lazarus needs to interact more with ashley because like the whole point like he should be like the watcher because he noted he says ashley says to him when he sees him for the first time are you my albatross a reference to the rhyme mm-hmm. of the ancient mariner you know the the captain kills i know it's um, pronounced albatross mariner. and oh don't let him be mariner. Yeah, for god's sake <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a focused pronunciation, all right. Uh, you, you, should, you should be thankful I didn't mention Spangler. I didn't want to tarnish his name with it, all right. Spangler mention, count one. <laughs> the, the gay bingo, right? But no, like it's just. Uh, I, you're great. Now I can, I lost Good. my track of fucking thought. So, yeah. So no, he, he Lazarus as a witness, right? Because because also about with Marlo from Horror Darkness. He witnessed everything, but he can't say anything. He's an eternal mute witness. And I think they should have kept that kind of a line. You got Sabo, you got uh, um, um, Ashley, you got Lazarus, maybe the professor and the daughter, and maybe one of the soldiers, six or seven characters, maybe eight maximum with the prince. And that's it. Well. Well, gentlemen. Next time... We're going to be covering the second half of Marty Phillips's Millennium, including stories called The Casper House and American Bastard. If Casper is about Casper the Ghost, I'm going to freak out, dude. I'm going to throw the book across I'm, the room. I don't care if a ghost is friendly. I'm still afraid of him. <laughs> it's just weird. It's just not, it's not God's intent from story one. Well, but it's a comedy because there's an afterlife. <laughs> oh. Yes, okay. fundamentally. <laughs> That's true. He is more he has done more evil than good. He should have let them die so they could get quicker to heaven. Should have just should have just take taken down every building. And what about Tower 7? Hmm? Hmm? <laughs> I still don't know the lore on Tower 7 to be honest. I know there's a lot of theories, but I don't know any of them. That's exactly what they don't want you to know. That there's been the five other towers um, that fell that day. All right, we'll, we'll wrap it there. Thank you, gentlemen. Another stimulating conversation. Yeah, like you said, Cap, we'll do, uh, do part two in a couple weeks. Then we still need to figure out what we're doing after that. Maybe something shorter. Maybe their magazine or something. But we'll see. Until then, thank you, everyone, that, that tuned in and listened this far. Make sure you uh, like, comment, and subscribe and all that other bullshit. Until then, ciao. Adios. Good night. You can expect more horror. can't recook cum man orgasm is an orgasm you can't reheat that shit